Thank you. I think this thing moves around, and that's what I do a lot is move around. I'm kind of known for it, so um, hopefully we'll just do that. Um, I really appreciate everyone being out here tonight. I know that uh, coming somewhere at 5 o'clock is not an ideal situation, but I really uh, not only appreciate you being here, but I appreciate all of the uh, support that I've gotten since I've been here almost 10 years now. Um, for doing the kinds of things that we've been doing up at the college. And um, although uh, Nan gives me credit for uh, you know, building the planning program, I, I have to say that we have some of the finest faculty, both in planning and in architecture, in the country. And it really uh, goes back to them. Um, today, I want to talk about um, the evolution of urban form, which is the topic of my book, which is for sale in the bookstore, conveniently. And if you buy it, I'll sign it. How about that? But first I want to talk, ask a little bit about the sort of where we are in terms of the audience here. How many people here have heard of smart growth? Okay. How many people here have heard of new urbanism? Okay. Both of these movements, of course, are, um, are ways in which people are trying to relook at how we have built cities over the past 50 years. There's quite a bit of unhappiness with the cities that we've really uh, created, particularly our suburban areas. And so one of the things that has always been a topic of my study has been to study how, how uh, cities change over time. So if we're going to change a city, particularly if we're going to change it in a significant way, we sort of have to understand where it came from. When we study uh, this, I, st I like to start uh, with something it's called building types. And that's because if, when scientists study an organism, they really like to look at the cellular level. And that's really the cellular level of a city. Um, and by building types, um, I don't mean an extraordinary building. I mean the sort of ordinary building, the buildings that fill up our cities. Now, there are rules that apply to types that I'm going to suggest to you tonight. I'm actually going to give you two rules. So the first rule <coughs> is that um, types arise and evolve according to conditions in the culture, climate, and economy. Types are something that kind of emerge from the culture because they respond to the specific conditions uh, that they satisfy certain conditions in the culture when they arise, and they're sort of embedded in that culture. These types change over time, and that's what I mean by evolution. The evolution of building types means that um, not any particular building changes, but as we build another new one of those types, we change it just a little bit. Um, we like to think of evolution as a kind of, uh, uh, in, in, and we know it as natural selection. And as Stephen Jay Gould pointed out to us, uh, natural selection doesn't select for something that's better. It just selects for something that has a better chance of survival. So in our present day, we would love to think that all the new changes of evolution in our city are good ones that make us a better city. But in fact, what we really do is they satisfy the conditions of our culture. So just like this guy and his big gulp, you know, we are really looking at, um, at, be, at having a, um, a not something that's coming that's better, but it's more evolved in the sense of being able to survive the conditions. It's more satisfying to the conditions. So what are these conditions um, that, we, that we are dealing with? Well, the first and most important one is, of course, car culture. When um, the older type didn't really fit the car culture, as I, as I pointed out. Um, and, um, and the other big cultural condition is that in our culture, the most important value for development is the real estate value. If it doesn't play in the real estate market, it doesn't play. So we have evolved with the car a whole new series of types, things we never had before and never knew we needed, like strip shopping centers and big box stores and drive through fast food places, and of course, the gas station. Now, what I like about these types, 
nobody likes these types, but what I like about them, as somebody who studies them, is that they change really fast. It's sort of like having a Petri dish and sort of goosing it up so you can see how things change. So you're looking at it going, oh, changed again, oh, changed again. It's sort of like really fast evolution. Now this is a type that I talk about in the book. It's called a suburban office building, and it's pretty much everywhere. It's really convenient, it's really well used. Uh, people will move into it, uh, they like it. It's out in the suburbs. It has a sort of suburban lifestyle thing going on with it. And it's very much the same everywhere you go. So this is a very common type, and it's, a, it's really about the it really answers the conditions under which we live. Um, and this also illustrates another thing, which over time, a type, although it's associated with suburban office use, over time, it actually can be used for other things uh, and without it really losing any of the qualities of a type. So a type is really a formal thing, a form thing. Um, shape and size and so forth. It's not so much the use of the building. So for example, here it's being used by the University of Phoenix and you see this everywhere. And you have to wonder really about a university that uses a suburban office building as its main, uh, as its main gig. I mean, does that mean that it's going to be like a suburban office building on the inside? I mean, you're going to use it as a, as a student as if it were a suburban office building. So it's kind of uh, a funny little uh, thing to worry about. Now if we scale up from there, that was the cellular level, and we go up a little bit more. What we get to um, is something that uh, morphologists, and that's what I am, an urban morphologist, what we call a tissue or a fabric, which is um, um, a fabric, it, I think is more familiar term to planners, but it's called a tissue. Uh, after its French uh, title. Um, and that is the lots and the blocks and the streets. And this shows a neighborhood in Cincinnati that's just north of downtown uh, and how it developed out over time from the initial sort of tissue that it was platted, its first construction and then entirely different construction 40 years later where they basically tore everything down and built up a whole new neighborhood in a 50-year period. But what's interesting about it is they didn't change any of the streets. They didn't even change any of the lots. They just changed the building. So when you think about it, really, what persists in a city are the lots and the streets. So here's rule number two. The tissue of a police is originally designed to fit a particular type but once it's inscribed, tissues are very persistent. So if I, it's very easy to see that this subdivision was laid out to accept this particular building type, this single family house size, shape, and so forth. Um, it's hard to imagine a couple of hundred years from now, and I'm gonna ask you to do that. Imagine this subdivision a couple of hundred years from now. Now, we're not gonna change the streets, and we probably won't change the lots. So whatever happens here, it's gonna have that character that, so it's inscribed. What I call this is inscribed on the land, the way it is, it will not change. And how do I know that? Okay, here's Manhattan. We can do this with any city, we can, any old city. We can look at Rome, we can look at London, uh, and we can see, peeking out from beneath London, a Florence, a 2,000-year-old street plan. And in the tip of Manhattan, here's the tip of Manhattan, here, uh, in 1660. Um, if we trace these same streets, they are here. This is over, the black and white is overlaid on this, this basically on this brown map. Um, they're there, the same streets. Um, and they even have the same names. So this is the characteristic plat, not only of Salt Lake, but of the Plat of Zion, and also of other outlying areas and outlying towns and cities that Brigham Young founded. And he founded more 
towns and cities than any other individual in the history of time except some medieval princes. So he is a really, we should just celebrate him as a major planner. Um, however, uh, he did have this idea that we would have these rural kinds of big blocks. Um, that each of these lots was supposed to have a little house on it, and the rest of it was going to be orchards and gardens and not stables, um, and, and street, street trees and so forth. And you'll notice that another unusual quality of this grid is that it changes orientation every block. Now this sets up all kinds of problems. Um, but, um, uh, and I think what the ideal was is something that's you know, more like some of the smaller towns uh, that you, where you can still find this grid, where there's still a house on Basically, those are 1.3 acre lots, which wasn't very practical for a city. So they began to be subdivided right away. Now, what was practical for a city, you'll see here in this little red, that was the, the grid of Cincinnati, um, which uh, was one of the largest, largest cities that Joseph Smith had ever visited. Um, and actually, Joseph Smith had wanted not eight lots on a piece of land, he wanted 20 on a block. So just take all of those and divide them up in skinny lots, and that's what he thought would be the right thing. Um, but Brigham, didn't, uh, <coughs> Brigham Young didn't believe in that. He wanted things to be more separated, and uh, he wanted to be able to uh, not have to look into his neighbor's uh, house porch across the street. He wanted to look into his neighbor's orchard. Um, the width of the streets, which is everyone knows is quite unusual, uh, is a dimension that is taken directly, and, and the block size, are taken directly from the plat of Zion. So Brigham Young and his oxen turning around and all that, as far as we know, had nothing to do with that width. Uh, that's his kind of story. Now, he may have said that. Somebody might have asked him one time, why'd you do that? He gave him this story. But the truth of the matter is that it came directly from the plat of Zion. Four or five days into the settlement of Salt Lake, people started subdividing these lots and selling them off or keeping them. And they, sold, they, they subdivided them because the building types they wanted to put on them didn't fit the, the lot. They weren't appropriate. They were way, the lot was way too big for one of these urban kinds of buildings that we've been looking at. This is at the actual build out of the street where Lamb's Cafe is here, this is Main Street. And these are the way in which this was originally built out. So, um, so these little sort of haphazard alleyways kind of got built in here. Um, it was much, much denser than this ideal form, but it was very haphazardly done because uh, it wasn't laid out to support these types to begin with. And here's Sugar House, as I talked to you before about it. Here's the older grid. And then here are the new streets being built. Now these were built by people who owned that lot, that outlot. And sometimes they would buy a few of them. Now this particular set of outlots was all owned by Brigham Young. And at some point in his life, he gave his entire set of outlots to the city and they became the park. Um, so, but this is how the sort of cottages were built out down here. They really have a strong relationship, if you can see down here, to the older um, um, plat layout of the, of the lot. So even things that aren't physically there are still very persistent in the city. So we're sort of looking at these streets. You know, there are two normal lots wide and they're four normal uh, blocks long. And so you don't have anything that sort of goes through on any of these, in any of these areas. They don't go through this way. And they don't go through this way in the in-between blocks. So it changes the kind of structure of the city and how it's laid out. And it persists over time. Let's talk about changing these uh, taking these large pieces of land that are out in the suburbs 
and making them into sort of smaller cities. And we all know, I think, about the Cottonwood Project, uh, Cottonwood Mall Project, where the mall was torn down, the developer proposed um, a new urbanist development with mixed uses and even little streets that connected back to the neighborhoods and so on and so forth. Um, very lovely. I think the community, I don't know, Gene's from the Planning Commission here, but I think the community really liked this project in general. In fact, I think the developer got a subsidy uh, to try to build it, but it didn't get built. And it didn't get built because of the market, of course, uh, sort of collapsed at the time, and I think it's still trying to get off the ground and so forth. Um, but what that kind of illustrates is that, in a sense, this isn't natural. This isn't going to happen naturally. And by naturally, I mean naturally evolved. This is a big project. It takes a lot of money. It's not like what happened at 9th and 9th, where you know, one guy built a store, and then another guy built a store, and then somebody built a whole row of stores naturally. It evolved naturally. Uh, so here, we're sort of laying out uh, if the developer sort of laid out an infrastructure and sold off all the property, then we might see a kind of natural evolution of this. Uh, but uh, at the present time, it's difficult. And I think it's instructive to contrast this with another project built almost at exactly the same time, uh, which is, uh, many of you are familiar with the Sandy Gravel Bit. Pro I call it the Sandy Gravel Bit Project. I'm sure it has a better name than that now. but. Um, where uh, the developer uh, did not receive subsidies. In fact, he had to build a park. Um, and where um, a Walmart was built, this one, um, along with, a, I think it's a Home Depot or something, um, and an apartment complex. So this is a mixed use development, right? So this is, this is the natural. This one got built. This one got the financing. This one didn't have a subsidy, and it still got built. Why? Because it's midway, and I would argue that it's actually midway between an older way of doing things and a newer way of doing things. Um, and I'll show you why. OK, so here it is. And it's actually kind of interesting in its configuration. If we compare this Walmart with this Walmart, we see that we have something going on here that we didn't have 20 years ago. We have a much more orderly development. We have a mix of uses, although it's not like right on top of each other, like the old insula types. We have something that's almost starting to resemble a little pedestrian street here, although it's not at all. Um, it looks like this. Well, it's not too bad. So, and we have something that's very popular and was able to be built. So my argument a lot of the time is that we try to look and we try to find these places where there's, where there's incremental evolution going on. It's almost, again, with the Petri dish. We're looking at things that work, and they work because uh, they are the standard types. This is a Walmart. It's like any Walmart in the world. It's decorated, a lot prettier, um, although some architects would argue with that. But it's a lot homier than the old type. And yet, um, and it even, you know, sort of tries to invoke for us with its kind of fake second floor, the insula. You know, because it really wants to pretend like it's a homey old place that with the old shopkeeper in ancient Rome, but we kind of know it's a Walmart. And, um, and so there's certain, certain things going on here in the world that are not a sort of wholesale new urbanism, but really are a different kind of breed. They are things, and here is, uh, actually this is down by Sugar House, um, where the 21st South uh, sort of shopping center is, and you're all familiar with this. This, oops, sorry, this is where Whole Foods is. Sorry, I have to do this again. This is where Whole Foods is. Um, and I find this really fascinating 
because it's a mixed use too. There's an office building here, there's retail, there's second floor office and retail in here, as you'll remember, and off down this little pathway and this little lot right here is soon going to be uh, uh, residential with some retail. So what we have here um, is also interesting on a formal scale because um, it's, a, it's kind of like uh, if you had a big arterial street out here, which you kind of do with 11th Highland, um, you really wouldn't want to make, uh, if this were a, you know, a big arterial, uh, you wouldn't really want to make this a pedestrian street. But if you turn things inward, you could make this a kind of, over time, a pedestrian court. Now, I can imagine a time when the amount of parking we need is a lot less, not because we're not using cars but because the cars we have are tiny, really tiny, like you can stack them up and you can plug them in. And where you might just need for this particular project about that much parking. And the rest of this could be used for open space, for a plaza, and for other kinds of activities. Right now, if you wanna meet your neighbor, you're not gonna meet your neighbor out on Highlands or Levens. You're going to meet your neighbor in the parking lot. That's where the social space of this building is. So I invite you to think about how things evolve, what this will be like in 50 or 100 years. One of the biggest mistakes we think about is we don't plan for the next thing, not even the next phase, much less 50 years from now when the building we're building today gets torn down and replaced. What's underneath it? what constrains it. We tend to think about the buildings, but we don't think about the lots and the blocks that can really constrain our urban environment and its evolution over time. So I want to thank you. Um, this is where you can order the book online if you like to at www.planning.org. It's from APA Planning Books, or they have it right here. And I'd be glad to take a few questions if we have time for it.